Welcome to chapter 10 of Services Marketing. In this chapter, we're going to be dealing with one of the most interesting models in services, uh, the concept of the service scape, the way in which, because services are inherently intangible, and the nature of service as an activity and as a process is such that you're going to see that activity and process conducted in an environment and the consumer will use some of the messages, some of the cues, some of the elements of the environment as a way to assess and determine the quality of the service. So what we're going to do with this chapter is look at a fundamental model, the service scape model, the theories that underpin it, and talk to some of the ideas about how these theories should interact and interplay. This also means that this is one of the really pragmatic and practical chapters because ServiceScape deals with the physical world. And when we talk about the influence of, say, color or ambient conditions, heat, light, we're talking about basically real world physics, real world human responses. There's a lot of work that's been done in this area, so if you are interested, there's a series of research expansion packs to check out. But also, it's one of these moments where you can start seeing services marketing in application simply by observing the world around you. So, the purpose of the physical environment in service is to send a message. If you think about walking into an office, if you're walking into an office of a law firm, start picturing that, the visual image, the mental image. What are the physical cues and traits you're expecting to see? If the traits are there, what message does that send? If the physical elements are not there, what message would that send? So absence and presence of objects in the service scape sends a message. You think about the way we lay out McDonald's, you walk into the McDonald's, there is the lighting, the visual, the aroma, the actual vision into the kitchen, uh, the so you can see how things are progressing, speed, processing, that people are working back there, stuff's being cooked fresh. All these things are messaging. So when we look at this, the physical environment sends a message. You can use the physical environment to, to create attention, to draw people in to a service encounter. For example, you walk past, uh, you walk through a shopping center, the design of a store, is it designed to draw you in as a casual passer, as foot traffic, or is it designed to catch your eye and get you to look at the displays in the windows? Has the store extended itself out into the environment so that you've got racks of discount merchandise? So whilst your eye is originally drawn to the bargain, you're drawn into the store to access other aspects. How's the physical world used to trigger cues and responses? Third on the list then is the experience. And this is where the physical environment as an experiential. When you walk into a store, that store is trying to create value for you so that you'll exchange, you'll give them money. But what if the store itself is the environment? Take, for example, Disneyland. The whole design of Disneyland or Dreamworld or a nature park, nature walk, walk in the forest, look around the campus, the physical way the campus is laid out to create an experience, to create a sense and a sensory experience. So the whole idea inside this is you've got three purposes. When you design your service scape, are you sending a message? Are you drawing attention? Are you creating experience? And does the service scape add value? And does it add value that's worth enough that people will exchange money for it? If you actually consider the idea of something like a nightclub, where the cover charge to simply get through the door, you're paying for access to the service scape and then hoping the service scape delivers the experience you're looking for. Again, as with uh, all of the services marketing at this end of the chapter, 
you're looking also here at how does this theory and this framework into play with what we've already covered. So there are two models here, the Moravian Russell Stimulus Response Model and Russell's Model of Affect. Read the chapter. This is a co-creation time. This is, and this is the heads up. Those two do make a cameo appearance in the exam, so you do have to address them. There is There are points to be scored from them. But also, this is one of these things where I want you really to engage with the text, read it, have a look at it, but also then be willing to go off and maybe track down, have a look at what has been done with either of these two models. So this is a good actual opportunity to just personal exploration Put in the Moravian Russell Stimulus Response Model into Google Scholar. Search for Russell's Model of Affect. See how it's been used. So not just the text, but expanding beyond the text. All right, now we're going to talk over one of the best big models in the business. The Service Gate Model, Bittner 92. Uh, freely admit, I am a complete fan of this model and Really love the work Bitten has done here. It's also early 90s research was still a time where you could put big conceptual frameworks like this out into the market, and they were quite successful. So there are component elements of this model to talk about. And what I want you to understand is that this is a way to see the world. We start from the, we can start at either end of the model. You can say, what is the behavior that we want to achieve? So you can start with a goal and a metric. In which case, you want to be also thinking about this from the point of view, you'll note here we have employee response and customer response. So we've got an external and an internal. The internal is, what type of staff member do we want to have in our service, what type of person do we want to have working for us? Will the environment we design enhance their ability to work for us? Will it call, will it attract customers? So again, you go for a walk through a shopping center, you look at the stores, and you look at the different environments of the stores, and you walk past the skate shop that's got a skate ramp built into the back, you walk past the gaming shop that's got gaming consoles, available for test driving. You walk past the store that quite, hasn't quite got it yet. It's got, it's got staff sort of looking quite visibly uncomfortable in their environment because the environment doesn't suit the staff member you've hired. So what you're looking at here is, can your service scape facilitate your staff improving their performance? Similarly, what you also want from a service scape is, will it attract the right type of customer? Now, if you are trying to attract the, I'm a very serious businessman, very serious business person, very serious businesswoman, it's all about the seriousness, then it's going to be unlikely you'll be playing 90s classic rock. Despite the fact that's the age group of the people you're targeting, they're going to be, oh, I've left my irresponsible youth behind. Your soundtrack is going to be sort of Vivaldi, and a bit of a bit of a carry on, but it's designed to encourage approach behaviors. People go, oh, that, that's the sort of place for me. What you also want to do with your service scape, again, looking at the customer side here, is your behaviors are attract, stay, explore, spend, and satisfaction. These are not mutually exclusive. These are interactive parts. If your service is designed to be a throughput service, that you are dealing with peak demands, you have a very short turnover, your service scape will be facilitated to allow people to flow through, purchase, pick up, and leave. This is where your little shopfront cafes, your pop-up carts on the pathway from bus stop to building, this is where the idea is that you want to attract someone briefly as a detour and let them go back on the way once they've spent money with you. Alternatively, you've got the Stay Explore, 
So you've got attraction, which is to get people in. Stay, explore, and service scape is to have a service scape designed for people to be within the scape for an extended period. Universities are actually designed for stay. Uh, you think about a tutorial room or a lecture theatre, once you're in there, it's kind of hard to get out unless we're all going at once. But it's not really designed to explore. You're designed to be in a stay. Come in, stay in. Whereas if you compare somewhere like a theme park or a tourist attraction, the idea of exploration is to design a surface scape where you won't be able to deal, to engage with the entire scape in a single pass. For example, if you go to a venue, go to a nightclub that has three or four different floors, with different rooms, playing different styles of music. What you're doing there is you're creating an attract, but you're also creating an explore. Do you move between? Do you stay at one that's your favorite? Do you sample different types? This is one of the problems actually the festivals, uh, your big festivals that, and your big music festivals, is that the service scape that you need of stay explore is one where you quite often will have the clash of do I walk around the festival and just sample the vibe? But I just dropped $300 here and I've got an eight band lineup in the one staging area. So I should stay in that staging area not to lose my favorite spot. And the festival's idea was, well, we want you to explore and walk around so you would spend money with our retailers. This is where you get your clash and where you've got to really design your service scape. Because the other aspect of service scape is that you want to be able to encourage purchase. Now, if you've got a stay behavior, so you're encouraging people to reside within, you either want to be charging hourly rates, a peak overall fee, or have micro purchase options within the service scape. So you go to a theme park, you've, pay, you've paid money for a day's worth of theme park, but you also have the financial triggers and incentives of buying different items within the park, so you're spending more money whilst you're staying and exploring the environment. You can also then put uh, add-on levels like, basically think of it like video games for the real world. Downloadable content and in-application purchases are metaphors because they are the behaviors that we undertake inside ServiceScape environments. So you're looking at how we get people to spend more money. The last thing, satisfaction. This is the role of the service scape, the physical environment, in making it a value. Being in this place. And you're walking around, looking around, going, wow, I'm here. Like this is having those moments of, and particularly if you're a big fan of a TV series, walking past the points like, my show was filmed here. Or you're a big uh, sports buff, you're at a stadium. It's like, this is, you know, this physical place is providing me with a sense of satisfaction. So that's the positive, that's the point, what you're trying to do here. You can also design a service scape for avoidance, for deterrence. Set a service scape to discourage the type of customer you don't want. You walk into a store and it's a neon shade, such that neon can be shades. It is bright, it is well lit, it has the distinct sense that you are in a packet of bubblegum and it's playing 180 beats per minute. Now, yeah, pick your own type of music here, but 180 beats per minute dance music, it's high energy. Yeah, that's a distinct clientele. You can already start figuring what the merchandise looks like once I describe the store to you. And there'll be a whole bunch of you going, I do not want to step foot in that thing in my life. Which is the point. If you're not the market, the service scape should encourage the market that you want and discourage the market you don't. So how does this work? This is the outcome. The behavior is the outcome. What we deal with is we look at the internal responses. Now these are mirrored between employee and customer and we are looking for similar sorts of behaviors but we are mindful that on one side and the employee side you are paying that employee. On the customer side you're wanting money from that partial employee, co-creator, co-producer. So the customer responses we're looking for, we think about it from the cognitive, like the thinking aspect, 
the emotive, the responsive, the reactionary, and the physiological. So in this, when we walk in, uh, what are the triggers? What will people see and think? So what are their expectations? What would they assume a service like ours should have in terms of physical features? You walk into a massage parlor for a sports massage, and it's got sports memorabilia everywhere, and it's got signed jerseys, and it's got thank you notes from football stars saying, thank you for extending my career another six weeks. It's got every, it's like, you're looking at that, you're already forming a belief about the service based on the trigger in the room around you. It's like, wow, this is a sports physiotherapy, and look, signed jerseys from sports stars. They must know what they're doing. I'm in the right spot. We also have the uh, symbolic meaning. And I want to get your attention to symbolic meaning because you want to look at this. Uh, this is drawing on consumer behavior, on advertising theory, services theory. But it's also because you want to be mindful of it yourself. What do you start thinking about the symbols, the icons, and the artifacts that are in the environment with you? What are you supposed to learn from them? What are the messages they're communicating to you for you to learn and think about? You then have emotive response, so environmental triggers create emotive responses. You are looking for this from the point of view of when these you encounter these particular aspects of the environment, with the environment dimensions here sitting on the side, how does that make me feel? How do I feel about myself? How do I feel about others? If you've ever walked into a store and you're just, you've got that, everyone in the store is annoying and you are having to already set your shoulders against being in this store, then you have an avoid, you're getting an avoid trigger, it's an emotive response, you can't reason why, but you know you're getting it, so you're basically, you're not the customer, you're not who this environment was designed for. Lastly is the physiological element. Now, I like the fact that pain, comfort, movement, and physical, like, can you physically fit into this environment? Uh, hello, airline industry, we've got to talk. Your Things are getting smaller and people aren't. And I'm just talking here on the fact that there are more six foot something or other people on the planet for five foot five, for aircraft that were designed for people of an average of five foot five. If you're six foot, you occupy more cubic feet than you do at five foot. Especially when you fold it. So, can you physically fit into the environment? And then here we think things like queuing behaviors. Can, are there enough seats? Are there enough tables? Are there enough physical area, physical points of interaction with the service to handle? Pain? All right, this is an interesting one because we can sell pain. The Tough Mudder races, marathons, gyms, we sell pain as a feature. But on the other hand, if you've come to go shopping at, uh, if you come to somewhere to say, well, the dentist tries to sell you pain and not pain, but you've gone to an accountant and you walk out with bruises, something's gone wrong. You should be getting that from your money lender, not your account. So again, you can't, what you're looking here is, these are the three types of responses you should be aiming to trigger, a thought, a feeling, and a physical reaction because you're dealing with an environment. And that physical reaction can also be about movement, whether you cue your environment to have people flow through it, to have them stop, to have them engage at key points, then move on. A lot of stuff in this. So lastly, coming to the back, coming to where it all begins, the environmental dimensions. Where do we start from? Three key areas, ambient conditions, space and function, sign symbols and artifacts. Now the ambient conditions, sometimes you don't have control over it. Background noise, air quality, okay. welcome to sunny Canberra, says the billboard on you know, a smoke haze because there's a burn off somewhere in New South Wales. Welcome to... Okay. Welcome to the ski fields where it's too warm to ski. Some of those you don't get control. But in physical environments, all of these can be designed for. 
So you can design for temperature. As it happens, we're in a piece of uh, environment trivia is that most shopping centers, major shopping centers, during winter set to around 20 to 22 degrees, and during summer set to around 15 degrees. So in fact, it's colder inside a shopping center in summer than it is outside a shopping center in winter in quite a lot of environments. The idea is that the, because the outer environment is going to be very warm, more people are going to come to the shopping center, so the 15 degrees plus body heat will bring it up to the temperature they're expecting or hoping for. The trouble is when it's um, a small number of people in an environment that has been calibrated for a large number, it's really cold. One of the other aspects of the book we'll talk about, one of the things that's fascinating, and there's a huge amount of amazing research on this. I mean, someone gets paid money to do this. It is so cool. Scent-based marketing triggers. Somebody sat down and said, you know what? If this place smells like bacon, we're 52% more likely to get money than if it smells like pork chop. Figure it out. There's a lot of stuff on this. Go have it scouted out. Space and function, user design, we start seeing the link over to queuing behavior, we start seeing the link over to communication. You're also, with your furnishings and your equipment, trying to send a message. If you walk into a store and it is an antique store, and it's got a point of sales terminal that's running on an ancient machine, like a computer you recognize from your childhood, you're going to feel, you're going to get the message about wow, this really is genuinely an antique store, that is antique tech. Now underneath this, they could be the highest tech and most modern stuff ever, and they've got to, you know, they do their stock taking by wearing Google glasses. But so long as the whole visual appeal is consistent. So your integrated marketing communication theory of that consistency through how the space is laid out, how the function of the environment works. You're also thinking about this from the point of view of service planning and service blueprinting because the function and the functionality needs to occur. The space needs to be able to deliver the service that you are promising. And if it's a high interaction service that requires equipment, that that equipment facilitates the co-production or the co-creation. Lastly, signs, symbols, and artifacts. We talk a little bit more about this, but basically there is a role for each of these. But everything in a service can be planned, cued, and triggered to perform a role. So the way the signs are set up, the way messages tell you where to go, how to go, the what the uniforms and the equipment and the elements. So you walk into a restaurant, you look at the cutlery and the plating, and that's going to give you a cue about what to expect in this restaurant. And you may not be consciously aware that you're doing it. That's the other thing. A lot of this, the sign symbols and artifacts, is designed to facilitate without a conscious cognitive, oh, three forks, two knives, and a spoon. I guess I know what's on the menu isn't something you're going to say. You're going to look at it and go, right, how is that consistent with my experience? What have I seen? When I've been in a restaurant, had that sort of layout before, what's my experience has been? A whole bunch of subconscious processing, which will then help set your expectations, which will then be delivered on. So we talked over the different parts. I want to briefly draw your attention to a couple of things. Music, sense, and color. So the physical ambient environment. Music is a very important aspect and one where you can tell the market segmentation and you can use music as an approach avoid. Knowing the age of your audience who is shopping or engaging your service at a particular time period lets you pick what classic tunes should be available. So people coming of age in this uh, decade will be in 30 years time so you're about you're in your early 20s now. When you're in your 50s and you're going to the shops and Uptown Funk is playing on the soundtrack, you know that that is being targeted to your age group for now and here. As I know, every time I get to hear Nirvana over 
the in-store radio when I never heard it on the radio when I was uh, in my formative years. It's also really interesting when you walk around to see what do people think are the definitive songs of a generation when these are being used as the soundtracks for quite clearly age-based segmentation of who's shopping in the store at this time. Music also has a couple of elements where you can use tempo to guide and direct uh, big furniture stores like IKEA, change the music soundtracks based on the number of people in the store. The more people you have, the faster tempo. So they will actually not quite DJ it, but definitely switch over to, if they need to throughput a lot of people to avoid crowding and clustering, they'll switch up the beat and switch up the pace of the music so that as you are subconsciously keeping pace with the tempo, you're moving through the store much faster. If it's a slow day, they will go and slow the music down, use the slower tracks, so that you keep, again, keeping pace with the tempo, you spend longer, you contemplate, you probably buy more. Yeah, it's, if you're having that moment of going, wait, what? Pay attention to your surroundings. Pay attention to your environment. Scent and colour. Colour, there's a lot of theory. Uh, colour is very culturally driven. And it's very important that you understand that whatever you do in this respect, you need to beta test against your audience. Scent, be really mindful that strong aromatics, hello, Lush, uh, T2, Lush, some people can't actually enter those environments and still breathe whilst they're in there. And certainly, well, if you've got a very strong aromatic design to your service scape, and you're thinking about this from the point of view of the customers will only be in there for, say, 10 minutes at a time, your staff will be in there for eight hours a day. So scent is important that you are thinking about how does this facilitate my staff. Same for music. Uh, if you're going to use short, fast, and sort of attention grabbing, remember that, yes, that loop's going to be 1 minute 30 seconds. People will be in the store for 5 minutes, so they'll only hear it twice. Staff will hear it thousands of times. Service escape impact on your employees. Can the ambient con conditions facilitate your staff in enjoying their job so that they can do their job well? to serve your customers. Just want to raise the, again, I've got the color chart in here just to give you the heads up for how well do you actually link to any of these things? So you're looking at them going, hang on, wait, what? You'll note that we've got a whole bunch, I mean, color theory and color research could be a great area to get into. And I will freely admit that on this course, yes, I have intentionally used the color bars and color schemes so you can play a small exercise in, on this set of slides, what colors does the course use? And what message am I sending through the course there? Okay, physicality. Coming down to a couple of the uh, critical elements here. I've talked about spatial layout. People are part of the physical environment of the service scape. So you need to ensure that if people need to interact with each other, the service scape facilitates that. And this is one of the things we do terribly in higher education service scape design is we don't quite know, we try and build multifunction venues and then hold the wrong type of service interaction in those venues. On the signs, symbols and artifacts front, there are four roles. Integrated marketing communication. The physical, the map, the layout, the environment, the signs and the symbols you use need to be consistent with the rest of your branding. You might have seen those passive aggressive notes, things that go around BuzzFeed and the like over time with the, we are a Fortune 500 company, do not use Comic Sans. Well, they're not actually kidding on that front. We're, we've got branding. IMC needs to be centrally considered. Even things like a note stuck to the door has a certain cue to it of do we was this unexpected? It's written in handwriting. Was it expected? It's on a printed logo. So it's queuing. It's IMC. You also you want to use your design of your environment to teach your customer 
And this is one of those things that's important in terms of thinking, what do I need my customer to know? How can I set up my environment to contain symbols, images and artifacts that helps me teach them what they're supposed to do in the environment? Which brings us down to the last couple of things. Designing. Pushing you back to the text, but also telling you to look at this other area of existence called user experience, UX. A lot of UX work is around technology, computers, software interface, but really they've got an enormous body of information about customer-centric design and customer-oriented work, well worth getting into looking at uh, user experience. Also, services marketing theory and UX dovetails beautifully. Last thing to talk about is the idea of guiding the design. So how do you actually, you've got all this theory, you've got all these frameworks. First thing you want to do is observe your environment. Look at how, once you've set an environment up, go and look at the wear and tear on the environment. Look at the damage. Look at where the carpet's worn down. Look at where there are paths walked through grass. Look at where paint is chipped. Where are there marks on the wall that indicate people are either leaning or pressing against? Or look at how the gear wears down. Use your observational research, marketing research techniques. Second thing, talk to your people who work in the environment. If you're designing an environment from scratch, get used to the idea that you're going to be living in it and working in it. And work in it yourself. Actually experience the environment as it's implemented rather than just the environment that you conceptualized. Service blueprinting, mentioned it a couple of times, really critical here, very valuable, definitely do it. Because you're looking at here, what are the touch points where people are going to interact with your environment? Well, ServiceScape deals with the front end and that element on the service blueprint where it says physical evidence includes ServiceScape. So there's a fieldwork exercise in the slide deck. I'd like you to undertake that exercise. I'd like you to look through it and think about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Finally, preparation from here. Again, you're a few chapters in. This is one of those big crossover into uh, active overlapping chapters. When you do your notes for this chapter, go back and look at how you would be able to integrate service scape thinking into some of the areas you've looked at previously. What is the role of the other chapters, the previous nine chapters, where do they overlap, where do they interplay? Because the service scapes are classic, classic question to ask on an exam. It's one of my favorites. So keep that in mind. Make certain your notes are up to date. Make certain you know where your notes are. It's late in the chapter. It's, it's Time to start compiling, compositing, and making certain that you're seeing the wires cross over. Your other task for this week and this chapter is look at your course readings literature review notes and ensure that you are also able to say, well, how does that cross over with the textbook? How are my notes into play? How am I documenting this? How am I keeping my materials together? As always, if you need me, connections are over the email, on Twitter, through the hashtag, or face-to-face -face physical meeting. For those of you who have walked into my office, you are now fully aware of the fact that it is a deliberately constructed and designed service scape. And yes, I'm very conversant with service scape theory. Every part of that office has a purpose. Nothing is left to chance in the service scape design of my office. So if you haven't seen it in operation, swing by, have a look, and start trying to figure out which theories am I using? What have I got in play happening here? How and why am I doing it? And yes, it is a constructed and designed service-scape platform to facilitate my work and the interaction I have with my students.